Good evening and welcome to New Canaan Library. We are the heart of the community and place to explore your intellectual curiosity. To deliver on these goals tonight, we are delighted to have Stanford Hospital here for the fifth in our spring series of Med Ed. Fourth. Fourth. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we welcome back Dr. Dina Ebright, our physician moderator who knows which number this is in the series. Um, who will introduce Dr. Michael Bernstein, our expert on the pulmonary system. Dr. Ebright. Thank you. Um, good evening to everyone. Some new faces here, welcome. Um, this is our fourth lecture. We have one more next week. Um, so the, the MedEd series is a collaboration between Stanford Hospital, the library, and the new Canaan Chamber of Commerce. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Dina Ebright. I'm a general internist um, with Fairfield County Primary Care here in New Canaan. I'm going to introduce you to our speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Bernstein, who's going to be speaking on lung biology um, and disease. Uh, Dr. Bernstein went to college and medical school at Duke University, and then he did a combined residency program in internal medicine and pediatrics at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. He then stayed at Mount Sinai to complete his fellowship training in pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. Dr. Bernstein joined Pulmonary Associates of Stanford in 2010. He leads the bronchoscopy and advanced diagnostic pulmonary procedure team at Stanford Hospital and is also a co-director of the lung cancer screening program with my husband. Um, uh, so tonight, Dr. Bernstein is going to speak on um, lung biology and disease. Thank you. See, the mic works. So I want to thank you guys all for coming. I guess part of the introduction that uh, Dr. Ebright didn't mention is I'm actually somewhat of a local kid. I grew up in Fairfield uh, and for years have come down to New Canaan. Uh, all the way when I was about four or five years old, my aunt was taught in the New Canaan school system, would drag us to uh, middle school plays at Sachs Middle School when she would direct them all the way through there. So uh, I took a tour, obviously, as she mentioned, through the rest of the country and came back here to Fairfield County. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here uh, for the last five years. So uh, I'm a lung doctor at Stanford Hospital, and lung doctors do pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine always all together. Uh, but I'm going to focus really on lung, uh, lung diseases tonight. Uh, the federal government and Stanford Hospital always like us to disclose if we have any conflicts of interest in terms of uh, equipment and things. And really, in terms of what I'm going to speak about specifically tonight, I don't. So. Every doctor likes to think that their organ in the body is the most important thing going on. So neurologist, the brain, cardiologist, the heart. And clearly, as a lung doctor, I think the lungs are the most important thing. But part of my uh, goal tonight is to explain that to you all as well. But if you look at the top 10 causes of death in the United States, four of the 10 are really related to lung disease, uh, with cancer being the number two cause of death. If you look at this, this is statistics from 2010 and has COPD, it's a little bit fuzzy, I'm sure, in the back, as number four. And I can't say proudly that COPD has passed stroke as the third most common cause of death. Uh, lung infections, including pneumonia and influenza, uh, would rank number eight. And sepsis, which is something as critical care doctors we take care of, is number 10. So in terms of death, uh, lung diseases are very important. Uh, moreover, in terms of cancer deaths, again, not to start off on a totally morbid way of looking at this, lung cancer is by far the number one cancer killer in America. In fact, more people die of lung cancer than prostate cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer. And in fact, if you add leukemias and lymphomas here combined, uh, would not equal lung cancer. Amongst kids, uh, Dr. Ebright mentioned back in the day I did more with, with kids, but for kids, uh, the top 10 reasons for hospital admissions in the United States, three of the top 10 are lung diseases in terms of pneumonia, acute bronchitis, and asthma. And in fact, if you look at smoking, and the vast, vast majority of people who start smoking start smoking under the age of 18 as kids, if you include that uh, as a pediatric disease, the burden of lung disease, even in the pediatric population, is tremendous. So. 
for an internist or any of us who started internal medicine, sort of the godfather of all medicine is William Osler. So William Osler was the original chairman of the Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, uh, along with uh, Welsh, Harvey, and uh, Halstead founded Johns Hopkins. And we all think of, for internal medicine, his guru. And he had lots of quotes. And one of the most important ones is he said, he who studies medicine without books sails an uncharted sea. But he who studies medicine without patients does not go to sea at all. So to me, to talk about lung disease and not talk about patients is kind of hard. Uh, unfortunately, we're here in a library in New Canaan, so I can't bring patients here together to speak. But what I'm going to do over the span of the next hour or so is first talk about lung disease in general. So uh, while it took us four years of med school, three, years of, three or four years of residency, three or four years of fellowship, I'm going to try to do all that in about 20 to 30 minutes. So hold on, we'll get that there. And then over the course of the second half, use actual patients, and you'll see who these patients are, to describe a series of particular lung diseases to illustrate. And in particular, I'm going to speak about lung cancer, pulmonary emboli, pleural diseases, TB, COPD, and asthma as well. And then it's hard for a lung doctor not to talk about tobacco uh, and how that plays an important role. So when you start medical school, the first year in the very first class is usually anatomy and histology. So when you think about anatomy and histology, that's the structural makeup of the lungs. So we think of the lungs as more than just the lungs themselves, but really the entire respiratory system, which will start all the way at the nose and heads all the way down through the lungs. I think there's a pointer here. So. All right, well, we'll point as we need to here. Uh, so in particular in the lungs, the lungs are really wrapped around the heart. So lung doctors and heart doctors love to fight with each other. Sorry, hold on one technical second. Sorry. Well, I'll keep going without the pointer for a second. So the lungs are really wrapped throughout the heart in terms of understanding how heart and lung anatomy work. So blood will all come back to the right side of the heart. Oh, all right, I was hoping for an uh, actual red pointer. Don't worry about that. So on the, on the right side here where the heart is red, that's what we consider the right side of the heart. Oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. I'm like a weatherman off and running. So lung co blood comes back from the body onto the right side of the heart. And the lungs literally sit in the middle of the heart, divided between the right heart, which is in blue here, and the left heart. And really, the entire purpose of the lung simplified down is to oxygenate blood and remove carbon dioxide. And I'll explain on a more cellular level how that happens. But blood will come down, draining from either the brain or below into the heart and then out into the lungs themselves. And then they travel back into the lungs, back into the heart. This is what we consider the left side of the heart. And blood goes out the aorta through the rest of the body. In particular, the lungs have, a, have their own unique anatomy. Uh, and they're divided, obviously, in two parts, the right lung and the left lung. The right lung is made up of three components, which we call the, right, the upper lobe, the middle lobe, and the lower lobe. On the left side, there's really only two parts of the lung. And that's because the heart, and again, lung doctors get annoyed with cardiologists because enc they encroach in our space, but they sort of smushed out the, the left lung. And so the left lung is left with only two segments the left upper lobe or lingula, which is the component, and then the lower lobe. And by nature, about 60% of our lung function in blood is on the right side, and between 40 and 45% uh, would be on the left side as well. Within the lung, the lung is really just a series of small highways that keep dividing out. And so the lung starts with the trachea, as we're saying in the breathing system, and it will divide out into something called a bronchus. And this just keeps dividing out, 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 till you get to a very small sac that looks like a sac of grapes that we refer to as an alveoli. 
And it's within the alveoli that oxygen exchange and carbon dioxide exchange will happen. So from anatomy, you move down now to a cellular level, and this is another way of looking at it. That blood will come in on the pulmonary arteries, cross these what we call alveoli, where gas is exchanged across, and then come back through a pulmonary vein to return to the heart. Unlike the rest of the body, where we think of arteries as having oxygenated blood and veins as having deoxygenated blood, the lungs are the opposite. There's, blood, there's only oxygen. Oxygen is going to be in the pulmonary veins because they've already gone through the lungs. So lungs, like us, are quite contrarian. Uh, on a cellular level, what we would call histology in medical school, uh, the lungs have, uh, a, the pulmonary alveoli is made up of a bunch of different types of cells. Uh, the classic cell is a pneumocyte. Those are the lung cells, and they are where gas exchange occurs. But there's also cells that hold the lung together, and those are often referred to as fibroblasts, capillaries where blood flows, and this is all the cellular type. This is a normal picture of a lung histology that shows lots of white space. White space is air, and the lungs are really just a giant sponge that you could actually wrap up in your hand if you wanted to. Now the lung itself, as I was mentioning, start, or the respiratory system starts all the way up in the face, coming down through the trachea into the lungs themselves. But one of the unique features of the lung is that it's wrapped really in an envelope of two tissues that we call the pleura. And these allow the lung to expand and contract back and forth. And the lungs come down through negative pressure as your diaphragm, which is the bottom muscle here, comes across and air will flow downhill into the lungs. Now these areas, the pleura, can be a host of both air and fluid or other cells in terms of diseases, and I'll get through that in the second half as we talk along. The other part of the lung beyond just the tissue itself and the pleura is a series of lymph nodes that come throughout the lung. So we all feel underneath our neck when we have a viral infection or something, you can feel lymph nodes there. You can't feel the lymph nodes in the middle of your chest, but there's a series of lymph nodes that drain the lung as well. And these become very important because for lung cancer, if these lymph nodes are, uh, have cancer cells in them, that changes the stage of the lung cancer. So once again, alluding to what we'll talk about in the second half here, but these numbers become very important to understand that there's lymph nodes within the lung. Now, that was anatomy and physiology. That's all we did for like three months of med school. So I hope you got it there. Fortunately, we did it with other parts of the body. Now, physiology really refers to how the lungs function or how the body functions. And the lungs function by just moving air across. So the, the really important equation we use for understanding the lungs is something called minute ventilation. And that's basically how fast we move air. And the minute ventilation is a reflection of our respiratory rate, how quickly we're breathing, and our tidal volume, how big a breath we have. And you can balance the two together. You can breathe very small, shallow breaths very rapidly, or you can take a bi few big breaths, and you'll accomplish the same issue during the lung to move air across. The other issue during breathing is that the lungs, again, function with negative pressure. So as you pull down, the lungs will pull down, creating a, a vacuum, and air flows through us. It's a very passive system on how we breathe. So I'm going to go through, I mentioned minute ventilation. I'm going to talk about something called VQ mismatching and another issue called zones of ventilation and perfusion. So as I mentioned, the lungs actually are very different size at what stage of respiration you are. So these are two x-rays here, and they're the same person, and when you've, when you've ended your breath, the bottom of the lung is here, corresponding. When you've taken a deep breath in, your lungs will expand greatly, and they'll fill your thoracic cavity and become much larger. Anybody know what this is? Iron, iron lungs. So uh, anybody see an iron lung in their lifetime? Right, so they're sort of, uh, at this point, gone out. But this is from the polio epidemic explaining the iron lungs. And the way an iron lung works is it works with the same physiology principles as how our body breathes. You're actually creating a vacuum or a negative pressure within the iron lung. So the patient's head is here, their body is in there, and air will breathe down. And the reason that's important is polio affects the diaphragm. And if your diaphragm doesn't pull down, you're unable to breathe. Uh, this is from a few years ago. 
uh, at this point it's about five years old, uh, and it's a story from Australia that that was the last patient with an iron lung in the world who died. So uh, there are no more iron lungs out there. She actually had been adapted down to like almost a portable iron lung, but it's a much more natural way of breathing if the patient can't breathe themselves. Now in the hospital, when somebody can't breathe now, we don't use an iron lung. There's a lot of reasons for that. One, it's very hard to touch or get at the patient if they're in a giant cylinder uh, as well. And if the patient uh, needs other issues, you can't use an iron lung. So we use something called positive pressure ventilation as opposed to the way we would all breathe naturally, which is negative ventilation. And here in a hospital, if you're not breathing, this patient looks very comfortable, but usually not like this. There's a tube going into your mouth, down your trachea, into your lungs, and pushing air down into that system. All right, so the second major physiologic principle besides minute ventilation is what we call gas exchange. And I showed this as a sort of histo histologic principle, but this is a physiologic way of looking at how oxygen and carbon dioxide move throughout the lung. In the external environment, there's lots of oxygen and there's low carbon dioxide. As, as oxygen comes throughout the body, it flows around all the way into your tissues, your muscles that are using them, and they make carbon dioxide, and this comes all the way back to the lungs, which exchange it back and forth. And really at a simplified scale, this is how the lungs work. They're gonna basically provide a membrane that oxygen comes in here and it goes across, and carbon dioxide does the reverse. Now within the lungs, there's very different amounts of oxygen depending upon where you are. The lower portions of the lung actually get more blood to flow in those areas, and we call those zones of perfusion. There's more blood, and it's simply a matter of gravity. If we're standing up and blood is going through, the lower parts of the lung will have more blood flow through it. The upper parts of the lung have higher levels of oxygen. And again, it's a, it's a scientific principle of a lower partial pressure for oxygen, it will, it will come up and be higher in the lung. And certain types of diseases will occur in different parts of the lung because some have better blood flow and some have more oxygen. All right, so just to summarize the first part here in terms of anatomy, histology, and physiology, the lungs are more than just the lungs themselves. They're really the entire respiratory system that starts at your mouth and nose all the way through the lungs. If there's anything to remember about the lungs, it's about exchanging deoxygenated blood back to oxygenated blood for the body. This is gonna occur at a level called the alveoli in the lung. And there's two principles that we'll try to remember for the second half here. One is minute ventilation and how you exchange air. And the other is that you need to match blood flowing and oxygen transferring across in the lung. All right, so in medical school, your first year or two is spent in a classroom with people just giving lectures all the time. And somewhere during your second or third year, they free you out into the hospital to actually touch patients uh, and see them. And this is where you learn your physical exam, you learn basic laboratory exams, and other radiologic or other studies. So what I'm gonna do now is go through what we as lung doctors look for in terms of examining patients, the basic laboratory tests we use, and then what other exams in terms of uh, studies, what we call pulmonary function tests, radiologic studies, or actually looking in the lungs, something called a bronchoscopy moving forward. So all, like many doctors, the first thing we'll do is a physical exam and we'll look at a number of vital signs. Uh, the vital signs include respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, your temperature, your, heart and, your height and weight, and increasingly something called a pulse oximetry, which is a measure of oxygen throughout the blood. I'll get to that. Now, in terms of examining the lungs, we almost always want to examine the lungs from the back because that's what you'll hear better. Now, I, I always say to myself, when I retire, I'm going to design a better hospital gown because if you've ever put one on, they're awful. Uh, but you'll see, if you're at a lung doctor's office, we always want the gown to open in the back. Cardiologists always want it to open in the front. Um, I don't know what orthopedics <laughs> really would ever want you to do. But... Uh, it's because that's where we principally listen to the lung so you can hear, he hear your way down. And we'll listen basically back and forth listening to symmetric sounds. Now there are three sort of famous lung sounds that we describe uh, to people. One is called wheezing, one are rails, and one are ronchi. So wheezing is a high-pitched sound uh, that occurs during breathing. And it's basically because of narrowing 
within the lung tree. Rails are a much more classic crackling or pop popping sound that occur because there's fluid in the alveoli. And ronchi are deeper sounds that, uh, that occur that almost sound like a snoring. And these are caused by uh, secretions in the bronchi. So if you think anatomically from the picture before, rails are going to be occurring way out at the end, those little popcorn areas, the end called alveoli, when there's something wrong with those. Ronchi are going to make sounds when there's something along the airway creating an issue. Now, one of the things that we often hear is somebody went to the doctor and they listened to them and said they had pneumonia. Uh, no x-ray, nothing else. Now, I'd love to say, and this is somewhat a generational difference within medicine. Uh, this is an article from Archives of Internal Medicine, a major journal, now about 15 years old. And I hate to be uh, depressing about this, but basically says you can't really diagnose pneumonia by just listening to people in a physical exam. You need more of an x-ray or another test going forward. Yet, we still try to listen to people and make the diagnosis that way. Now, I mentioned before, increasingly as part of a pulmonary uh, physical exam, we use something called a pulse oximetry, which in the last 30 years, certainly as a lung doctor, I will make the argument, was the single most important invention in all of medicine, because it allows you to test the oxygenation of blood without an invasive test. And it's a very, very unique and neat way of looking at uh, light waves crossing through hemoglobin and seeing how much uh, the oxygen is, how many uh, molecules of oxygen each hemoglobin molecule is carrying. Uh, but basically, if you see it now, it's all the way down to uh, just a small finger device uh, that can measure your oxygenation. I know, uh, talking to people a little bit older than me, uh, in the Mount Sinai neonatal ICU, uh, before you could test pulse oximetry, the only way to check how much oxygen was was to actually draw blood from an artery. And uh, they started using this sort of in the late 1980s, and one of the attendings told me that they were doing somewhere around 6,000 ABGs, so sticking the baby 6,000 times a year in the, in the mid-1980s. Five years later, with the development of pulse oximetry, they were down to doing it about 1,000 times a year. So it's a very important invention uh, in helping us to see how much oxygen somebody's body carries. Now, beyond, I had mentioned that when you're looking for pneumonia, just doing a physical exam probably isn't going to stand the test of time now. So we often need to use other studies, uh, principally radiographic studies, pulmonary function tests, and something called bronchoscopy as well, which is a way of looking in the lungs. Now, radiologic tests, there's a number of them available. There's chest x-rays, CAT scans, ultrasounds, nuclear medicine tests. And I'm going to try to explain why and in what circumstance you would use each of these and really, it has to do with the anatomy of what you're looking at. So we'll build upon just a few minutes ago. Pulmonary function tests are the sort of hallmark for us to see how your lungs are doing. So I'll briefly explain that. Bronchoscopy is an important way of looking in the lung and certainly something I have a strong interest in. And it's really, when you're thinking about what test to use in the lung, it's going to be what part of the lung you want to look at. So... Uh, chest x-rays were developed by Wilhelm Röntgen, so the old name was Röntgengrams, uh, at this point more than 100 years ago. And in the United States, I think this number is probably off, it's about three years old, there's more than 150 million x-rays done annually. And if you look at it, chest x-rays, pound for pound, are probably one of the most cost-effective tests we have to examine the lungs uh, and the upper part of the chest as well. This is a normal x-ray, so the conventional way we look at an x-ray is the patient looking at you. So this is the patient's right lung, this is the patient's left lung, so they're standing like this, and often we turn the patient on the side and get something called a lateral view of the lung. Now within the x-ray of the lung, there's a few things beyond the lungs you can look at. In the middle here tends to be the heart, the bones and ribs will come across as well. You can see the shadow of the stomach. But because the lungs are principally air, it's really easy to fire an x-ray beam through it and look to find abnormal parts of the lung. Now, chest x-rays were the mainstay of looking at lungs really until the 1960s and 70s and clinically into the 80s, CAT scans became the, one of the great ways of looking at the lungs. So we used to use the term CAT scan, which was computed axial tomography because we were only cutting a patient axially across their chest this way. 
Now we can cut them this way, we can cut them this way, we can do all kinds of different things. And that's why you'll hear people drop the A in CAT scans and just call them CT scans. Or we drop the axial and call it assisted. Now, CAT scans were developed by uh, Sir Gottfried Hounsfeld, who was a British physicist, uh, in the 1960s. And part of the interesting story was that CAT scans, were, Hounsfield was working for a company called EMI, which was uh, also a record label. Uh, and they wanted to get out of the industry for record labels. Uh, sorry, they wanted to get out of the industry for medical devices. And in the 1960s, EMI signed the Beatles, uh, which helped them get all their money. And actually, some of the last money that EMI used before they just went completely on the music side was to develop CAT scans. So anytime you buy a Beatles album, you're, uh, you're helping support the CAT scan industry. This is a, a look at how CAT scans work, and they're really just hundreds of x-rays put together and rebuilt on their computer, and you can see. So we orient CAT scans the same way we orient x-rays, so this is always going to be the right lung, the left lung, and in the middle, the heart. So before, when we were looking at anatomic pictures, you saw the pulmonary artery wrapping around the heart, so this is actually the blood coming out of the heart into what we call the right pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery, and into the lung. And the CAT scans are a very uh, important way of being able to distinguish what's going on in the lungs themselves. Beyond just looking at uh, x-rays and CAT scans, one of the other devices we can increasingly use is ultrasound. Now, ultrasound is particularly good for looking at fluid. Uh, and that's why the two of the most common places for ultrasound in the hospital are echocardiograms, looking at your heart, which is a bag of fluid, and also for babies, which early on, swimming in amniotic fluid, you can look at uh, baby anatomy. And for a long time, it was felt that there really wasn't much of a role for ultrasound in looking in the lungs. But you can have a couple pathologies in the lung that have to do with fluid. One of them is if you have fluid around your lung, in that pleural space, the area wrapped around the lung, it will easily be seen by ultrasound. And that is the principal way we will look to see if you have fluid around your lung now, even more than a CAT scan, is to look by ultrasound. Now, one of the advantages of ultrasound is it's portable, it's easy to use at the patient's bedside, and it has no radiation risk. So there's an increasing push to try to use ultrasound in the lung as much as we can. We also have a number of other specialized studies for looking at the lung. One of them is something called a VQ scan, which matches how much ventilation with perfusion in the lung. So if you remember that chart with circles and squares going through, where you would see unmatched ventilation and perfusion, this is a way of looking. And it's a very important way, or was an important way, it's less and less, but to look for blood clots in the lung, something called a VQ scan, and I'll get to that in a moment. Now, just testing somebody's pulmonary function is very important for us to know how they're doing. And I like to say that we've all had pulmonary function tests. We start with that when we're about four or five years old, and you're in a pool with friends, and you say, how long can you hold your breath underwater? Now, that's a simple pulmonary function test. It's not one we typically do in our office. Uh, most of you would leave if we did that. Uh, but this is David Blaine, who some people call a magician, some people call an illusionist, but he set a uh, record for holding his breath underwater for 17 minutes. Uh, the way he did it is a lot of very cool physiologic principles of getting his carbon dioxide level down, but uh, our office doesn't have a giant pool that we stick your head in. We tend to use more modern technology. So modern pulmonary function testing is a little over uh, 100 to 150 years old, and it was developed by a British uh, physician named Sir Humphrey Davy, who, uh, the story goes, he came from a family that owned a beer brewery, and he was a sort of gentleman physician uh, who was making more money in his family's brewery than he was as a physician, and there were all kinds of barrels in the brewery. And what, they, what he ended up trying to do was have people take different breathing mechanisms by moving the barrels up and down. And from that, using a number of engineering and physiologic principles, he could measure how much air you breathe out in one second, how much air you breathe out total, the size of your lung volumes, and from there, develop modern pulmonary function testing. Now, it'd be fun if we had a brewery in the hospital and most of us probably wouldn't be working as much, but modern pulmonary function testing is really now all electronic. And this is a 
pulmonary function testing machine that also tests something called plasmatography, which are lung volumes. And pulmonary function testing is the basis for testing for a number of diseases, in particular asthma and emphysema or COPD. And so what we do in a pulmonary function test is we have the patient sit down and then breathe into a pipe that will allow them to see how much air they breathe out over, over time from there. And then really by calculus, we figure the area under the curve to figure out their total amount of volume of air they breathe out in a certain period and can standardize these for normals. There's a couple classic patterns on pulmonary function tests that lung doctors look at. Uh, one is called an obstructive pattern, meaning that you don't get as much air out in the first second compared to what you get out overall. And this is a pattern seen in asthma or emphysema. So this is obstruction and this is severe obstruction. Meaning you only are, we should normally get out about 80% of the volume of our air in the first second compared to the entire breath. It's something like COPD or asthma, you may get only 60%, 50% out overall. Another classic pattern is something called restrictive lung disease. And in this, you get most of your air out very rapidly and not much at all. And this is a pattern found in diseases such as pulmonary fibrosis or other scarring lung diseases. From here, we often get a big printout where we compare the breathing tests to, uh, to height, age, and race normals. These have been worked out through the years, and now we, in the United States, we use a system called NHANES, which is developed by the National Institutes of Health, which has upwards of a half a million pulmonary function tests in them to give the averages and normals for there. Your height is the major principal determination of your lung function. Uh, and it's really not your overall height, it's actually your height from your waist to your shoulder, although we don't measure that in particular. So people who have very short legs may actually look like they have better lung function than people who have very long legs overall. Uh, now, pulmonary function testing is one of the more sort of depressing things in lung, in lung tests too, because since we started tonight, oh, I don't know, about 35 minutes ago, our lung function has actually gotten worse for all of us in the room. Now, not enough that we would appreciably notice it, but lung function increases up to about age 25 and then just decreases the rest of your life. Uh, and such that the lung function on a 90-year-old is very different than the lung function on a 40-year-old, regardless of what's going on. Now, we use these lung function tests to help us categorize a number of common lung diseases. The chart here on your left is for COPD, and that's often defined as we call this ratio of less than 70, and the lung function tests help us define mild, moderate, and severe and very severe COPD and use that for determination of what medications patients should be on. Asthma has similar findings on a pulmonary function test and again, we use the pulmonary function testing to help guide medication as well. I don't know if this projects well, but you can actually see for asthma, we will classify asthma on your pulmonary function test based upon your age. Because if you use the same numbers for somebody who's 80 years old, everybody who's 80 would look like they have asthma on a breathing test. So there's different numbers to classify in that section. Now we have tests to just sort of take pictures of the lung. We have tests that give us the function of the lung. Uh, and one of the other important things for us to do is when we need to is to look in the lung themselves. Uh, and that's what we call bronchoscopy. Uh, and bronchoscopy is now done uh, through a flexible tube that goes into the lung. And this was developed really in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and almost exclusively, the initial developments came from Japan. And all the companies that make bronchoscopes are actually old Japanese camera companies. Olympus has about 90% of the, the market. Pentax is another one. And Fuji uh, is increasingly coming up. And uh, nobody would buy a camera company nowadays. And in fact, for lung doctors, about two years ago, we heard that Olympus was going bankrupt. Uh, and the reason nobody has a camera is because you have an iPhone or something and you take pictures and very few people buy cameras. Now, fortunately, the only part of these companies that people wanted was the medical device part. So the camera companies will continue to go from there. But a bronchoscopy allows us to look in the lung and see what's going on itself. From a bronchoscopy, we can actually send a small little wire out and make biopsies in the lung and we can use that. Now this is contrasted to a way a surgeon can actually send the camera into the lung and make a biopsy as well. 
So there's something we call bronchoscopy is a term people have heard to get a biopsy, which is a little piece going out. It's something often commonly called VATS, which is a video-assisted thoroscopic surgery, which uses a camera from the outside to get in. Now, the major difference between the two of them is one uh, will get bigger pieces by coming from the outside in, but it's a more invasive surgery. And so we have to balance between the two when we're deciding what to do. Uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of developments in bronchoscopy, uh, which is fun for lung doctors and really opened up a whole world to diagnose our patients in less invasive ways. And one of the things I talked about earlier was that we are increasingly using ultrasound and the technology has gotten good enough that we can actually put an ultrasound at the end of these cameras going into the lung in something called EBUS or endobronchial ultrasound. And these ultrasounds actually allow us to find those lymph nodes in the middle of the lung when we need to biopsy those to find out a stage of cancer. Uh, in fact, the ultrasounds have gotten so small that we can send them all the way out into the lung to help us find little lung masses to, uh, to make more diagnostic, uh, to increase our ability to diagnose. In the last two or three years, one of the other developments that have helped us is we actually have something called advanced guided bronchoscopy or navigational bronchoscopy. And the easiest way to think about this is that we actually can put a GPS system on the bronchoscope and drive throughout the lung. Uh, and just like when you're going to a theater that you don't know where it is and it tells you turn right, turn left, turn right, turn left, this is what we increasingly do uh, to try to find our way out to a different part of the lung uh, from there. And it's a very fancy system that guides itself all the way out into the parts of the lung and we can use that uh, to help either um, uh, biopsy of lung tumor or mass. We can also use it to put a little piece of metal if you need radiation therapy and surgeons can use it to mark where they want to go so they can do a less invasive surgery as well. This is another picture of how it works. So when thinking about how we examine the lungs and think about the lungs, it's really a combination of a physical exam, the radiographic test, whether it be an x-ray, a CAT scan, an ultrasound, uh, to help figure out the anatomic region we're looking at. So if we're looking at the lung tissue itself, it's often an x-ray or a CAT scan. If we're looking at the pleural space around the lung, it's an ultrasound. Now, I'll stop and mention one question that people ask often is why can't you do MRIs in the lung? Uh, and the reason you can't do an MRI in the lung, or it's very uncommon, is an MRI works by shaking water back and forth. And the lungs don't really have water. They're all air. So M while MRIs are fantastic for the brain, which is basically a bag of water, MRIs are great for muscles and tendons, there really is very little role in the lungs. And uh, what we call bronchoscopic techniques over the last uh, five to 10 years have really increased our ability to have less invasive ways of looking in the lung. So I mentioned before that Osler would tell you that all what we talk about if you're a student is only gonna get you so far, but you need to think about patients when you put it for diseases. So uh, st stepping off from Osler, I'm gonna violate uh, what we would consider to be HIPAA, which is patient confidentiality, by using a number of either celebrity or fictional characters to go through some of these lung diseases and apply sort of what we talked about for the first uh, 35 minutes here. I'm going to talk about lung cancer, PEs or pulmonary embolism, pleural effusions, pneumothorax, TB, COPD, asthma, and then talk about uh, smoking cessation as well. So, uh, so the nightly news is sort of increasingly unwatched, but if you go back a generation, obviously none of us here are watching it tonight, uh, in the 1970s, the lead reporter for NBC News was Chet Huntley. Uh, and fast forward one generation later, it was Peter Jennings. Now, Chet Huntley was diagnosed with lung cancer in 1974. Uh, and about, he went off the air, and about one month later, he died at his ranch in, uh, in Montana. Uh, fast forward uh, just shy of 30 years, and now 10 years ago, Peter Jennings was diagnosed with lung cancer, or publicly diagnosed with lung cancer in the summer of 2005. He went off the air, and less than four months later, he died as well. Uh, in the era from Chet Huntley's original diagnosis of lung cancer in the early 1970s, this, the five-year survival for all lung cancer was about 12%. Uh, 30 years later, the five-year survival for lung cancer 
is somewhere between 16 and 20 percent. Now contrast that with other major cancers where you'll see breast cancer, the five-year survival is 90 percent. Uh, for prostate cancer, the five-year survival now is close to 100 percent. Uh, and over the last 30 years, a number of cancers have had really significant improvements in their mortality rates. Uh, colon cancer has gone up almost 15%, all the while lung cancer only about 2%. Now, another way of looking at this, in 1980, almost 55 million people a year were watching the nightly news. This is 2004, it's like 20 million. I think in 2015, <laughs> it's probably about 3 million people are watching the nightly news. But at the same time, the lung cancer survival rate really hasn't changed much at all. Uh, so to think about lung cancer, I'm going to illustrate some of the points from anatomy and histology that I talked about earlier on. So lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer death in the U.S. There are two types of lung cancer, uh, both small cell and non-small cell. And in the U.S., 85% are, are non-small cell. Uh, and these are non-small cells generally comprised of something called adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And tobacco smoking is still by far the leading contributor to lung cancer. I mentioned this earlier that lung cancer, there are more cancer deaths from lung cancer than all the other major cancers combined. And if you look at this graph, you can see the prostate cancer survival rate. It's about 99% in five years in lung cancer. It's only 16%. Now, uh, guys like me who spend a lot of time thinking about lung cancer also like to point this out in terms of NIH cancer funding money. This is from the American Cancer Society. For every lung cancer death, there's about $1,400 spent on research. For breast cancer, about 14,000, prostate cancer, about 10,000. So not that we should each be competitive about our cancers, but lung cancer funding significantly lacks behind others. Now, when we look at lung cancer, the principal way we diagnose it still, although this is changing more and more each year, is by looking at those slides of histology. And in that, you can see typical abnormal cells that we will hand to a pathologist to will look and tell us if it looks abnormal like non-small cell or small cell cancer. Now, to understand lung cancer, you also have to think about the anatomy. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is from the New England Journal. And this is a patient who has very black lungs here that look like emphysema. They have a mass up here on the top of their lung. And of course, they also have a pack of cigarettes sitting out here. And this patient has 20 cigarettes, so they uh, haven't even smoked one yet today. So for lung cancer staging, the principal uh, component of staging out beyond being outside the lung, they're looking at lymph nodes going through the body. And what lymph node is affected has dramatic uh, uh, implications for the long-term survival. If you have no lymph nodes involved in lung cancer, your five-year survival is 77%. If you have lymph nodes on the other side of your mass, what we call N3 disease, your survival goes all the way down to 12%. So figuring out which of these lymph nodes is involved and understanding the anatomy of the lymph nodes is very important. So we use this very complicated way of grading and staging lung cancer in terms of one, two, three, and fours. We add A's and B's. They change this every five or seven years just to confuse us. But the simple thing to remember is the higher the stage, the lower the survival. And because those lymph nodes drive your diagnosis, the five-year survival for stage 1A lung cancer is six times the five-year survival for stage 3B or 4 lung cancer. Now, one of the unfortunate things is 75% of people diagnosed with lung cancer in the United States are stage 3B or 4. Uh, so often stage 1 and 2 until we started lung cancer screening recently was sort of dumb luck. You had a car accident, they found this little lung cancer. Yeah, you, you were getting a knee surgery, you found the lung cancer. And the majority of the time, we were finding it further on. So. In terms of trying to reduce lung cancer mortality, up until recently there wasn't much to do, but in the last couple of years there's been a big push for screening patients for lung cancer, which is something we have a team at Stanford Hospital doing. This got its big push in 2011 uh, with an article in the New England Journal that said that if you screen the appropriate patients for lung cancer, you can reduce death. And ultimately, just less than a year ago, the United States Preventive Service Task Force, USPSTF, uh, recommended that any patient between the age of 55 and 80 who smoked 30 pack years, meaning one pack a year for 30 years or two pack for 15 or three quarters for 70, 45 years, should have a low-dose screening CAT scan annually. 
this has been worked out and sort of some of the specifics are a little bit debated, but it's more than just running you through a CAT scan. It's getting everybody together to think about this uh, in terms of your CAT scan, uh, knowing what your risk is and putting together a team with radiologists, lung surgeons, lung doctors, uh, pathologists to put together a lung cancer program. Uh, and we have one at Stanford Hospital, which I'm proud to be a part of. Dr. Ebright mentioned the other Dr. Ebright in town is our major lung surgeon. Uh, and we have a big program that's starting to increasingly screen patients. Now, if you look at the greater Stanford area uh, in terms of the population, if you include uh, Stanford, New Canaan, Darien, and parts of uh, Eastern Greenwich, we would really need to screen upwards between three and 5,000 patients per year of people who smoke that much. So it's a big undertaking to try to find the right patients to screen for lung cancer. All right, so moving on to another of the lung topics and illustrating the point. Uh, the French Open has started. We're in the second round. And frankly, I don't know if Serena Williams has lost, but my assumption is she has not because she is arguably one of the, arguably the greatest women's tennis player ever. And in fact, if you removed her sister over the last 20 years, uh, she probably would have been the greatest tennis player ever. Uh, but a few years ago, Serena was sidelined for a year be or for about six months when she was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary embolism is a blood clot generally originating in the lower part of your body that flies off to your lungs. Uh, and it happens uh, to give patients significant symptoms, including difficulty breathing, chest pain, and they'll often feel palpitations. Now, when we examine them, we'll find on physical exam, often using a pulse oximeter, that they have low, low uh, blood saturation. They can look bluish or cyanotic. They'll be breathing very quickly and their heart rate is rapid. And uh, pulmonary embolism accounts for about uh, 650,000 cases of death in the United States, uh, which is thought to be the third leading cause of death in the hospital in the US annually. So to look at a pulmonary embolism, we can think what would be the best test to look at a pulmonary embolism. You're looking in the lungs themselves. You're looking at the tissues in the lung. So we use a CAT scan most commonly. This is the pulmonary artery. So this is blood flowing out of the right heart. And you can see along the way here, a long hot dog sitting right in the blood vessel. And that's a big clot that's sitting there. Now what happens if you have a blood clot there, going back to a slide from earlier, you will stop the ability to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide and your oxygen level will drop, which is that and along with dilating your right heart are the ways uh, blood clots kill patients. Now, what do we do about blood clots? Well, the mainstay of treatment remains anticoagulation. And for years, the two major medications for this were heparin and warfarin or Coumadin. And really the pharmacologic holy grail over the last I don't know, 70 years in medicine is to try to replace these two medications. Heparin always had to be given IV. Uh, and had to be given continuously. And Coumadin, which is really rat poison, was dosed by a guess and check method. So anybody here who's ever been on Coumadin will testify that it's an awful medication to have to be on because every two weeks you're getting it checked and if you're on, if you eat any spinach or something, it throws it off. Uh, really over the last 10 years, there have been major developments in new medications. If you watch TV, you'll see ads for these medications, Pradaxa, Zeralto, there are injectable forms called Erixtra and Lovenox, and they're increasingly used to treat PEs. Very rarely will we actually go into the lung and actually suck out or pull out the clot. But there is a new device that's increasingly being used that you put an actual little ultrasound machine here and break it up and bust it up. Now, when you do that, you still need to leave the patient on blood thinners afterwards. Very rarely and in very skilled hands, actually a surgeon can go in and remove the blood clot as well. Uh, but that's done in a very, very rare circumstance. And one of the other options we have, which won't prevent or treat, uh, sorry, won't treat a blood clot, but can help prevent it, is to actually put a basket somewhere lower down in the body to try to catch any blood clots coming up. We call those filters. And again, uh, the use of them is somewhat controversial. The best treatment is to anticoagulate or thin the patient's blood. All right, so moving along the anatomy and some of the other patients here, uh, about 10 years ago, Bill Clinton 
uh, went in for open heart surgery, and about a month later, he had to go back in the hospital uh, because he had fluid around his heart. Uh, and when you have fluid around the heart, we call that a pleural effusion, which is a collection of fluid here. Now, pleural effusions can occur in a lot of different diseases, and so we see them quite frequently. And we break them up into two separate types of effusions, one we call transidates, or fluid sort of flowing out, uh, and exudated effusions, which I like to think of as effusions starting within the space themselves. And the best way to figure out what this fluid is is we numb up the patient's back and put a little needle in and draw the fluid out. Uh, and then we use a series of criteria to help us determine what it is. Now these transidative effusions, which heart failure is by far the most common of the issues, uh, most common of the ideologies, also include liver disease and nephrotic syndrome, which is a kidney problem. As a lung doctor, if I draw the fluid out and it's very thin, watery fluid, the simple way I like to think of it is, it's really not my problem. <laughs> it's got to do with the heart doctor or the kidney doctor or the liver doctor changing the management. Sometimes we take the fluid out and it will give a, a diagnosis of something wrong in the space. Those can be cancers, so lung cancer, breast cancer, lymphoma, also infections, pneumonia, tuberculosis, other infections, as well as after heart surgery, you can get fluid in this area, and that's what Bill Clinton had, something called Dressler syndrome. And ultimately, uh, they had to remove the pleural area around his lung, drain it, and allow his lung to re-expand. Now, you can get fluid around the lung. You can also get air around the lung. So this is Tony Romo, who's still the starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, and about Four or five years ago, he took a kind of vicious hit in a Sunday evening football game. He then continued to play the rest of the football game that night until they took him for an x-ray after the game and realized that his lung was collapsed and there was air around the lung. Uh, now, most people would not continue to play a football game. I think the Cowboys lost that game. That's probably a good assumption. But uh, they ultimately had to go in and put a tube and drain the air out of the lung. Pneumothoraces will occur after trauma, so car accidents, football hits, but they can occur in young people spontaneously as well. Uh, and the treatment is usually to put a tube in here and drain the air out. Now, sometimes you can get these collections of air after surgery as well, uh, sometimes particularly after lung surgery, and the treatment uh, still is to usually leave a tube in to drain the air out. There's a kind of neat invention that's out nowadays where we put these little valves inside the lung to stop the air from accumulating out uh, into the lung for these pneumothorax. Now, lung doctors often love to tell the story of the American buffalo because it has a unique pleural space. So the lungs in a buffalo, we have two separate pleura, one that wraps around the right lung, one that wraps around the left lung, and they come together around the heart, so they stay completely independent. In the buffalo, the pleural space is actually just one. And so what happens is if you get air in that space, it will continue to accumulate, and ultimately there's so much air, the heart cannot pump blood out. So there's a great scene in the movie uh, Dances with Wolves where Kevin Costner is riding along in his horse, and they shoot an arrow at the buffalo. You always wonder how can they kill the buffalo so easily. And the answer is the buffalo dies of a pneumothorax. It doesn't matter where you hit the buffalo in the chest. As long as you puncture it with an arrow, air comes in, it will gradually fill, and you'll get more, you'll get uh, fluid, you'll get a pneumothorax from there. Now, if the buffalo gets hit with, a, with an arrow and doesn't do anything, it sort of just sits still and waits, this area can actually close off on its own. But if you force the buffalo to run around, it's going to breathe more, more air will come in, and the buffalo will collapse. So again, actually the movie's pretty historically accurate in that they would hit the buffalo with an arrow, and as long as they kept riding their horses behind them and made the buffalo run, they just run and then drop out, and the buffalo die of a pneumothorax. It's kind of a cool story. All right, so uh, <laughs> moving on to some of the other uh, fictional accounts as well. So this is... Uh, from the movie, or not the movie at this point, the play Les Mis. 
And if anybody sees the classic scene in Les Mis where Fantine is dying and Valjean comes to see her, Fantine is dying of tuberculosis. Uh, and she's actually in some of the either movies or play versions, she's coughing up blood. And tuberculosis is sort of the most, I want to use the term romantic or famous of pulmonary diseases. And in fact, pulmonary medicine as a field was started as a tuberculosis field. And originally, what we call the American Thoracic Society, which is the major uh, organization for all lung doctors, was what we now call ATS, American Thoracic Society, was originally the American Tuberculosis Society, and then became the American Trudeau Society, named after one of the famous pulmonologists. So for lung doctors, TB is still, I like to say, our most romantic disease. Now, TB uh, is caused by a disease called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and about a third of the world's population has TB at any given time. Uh, it's usually dormant in most people, and clearly in the United States, it's not as common. Uh, TB, the symptoms, which you can see in the movie or play Les Mis, uh, include coughing up blood, night sweats, and loss of weight, and that goes to its old name of consumption because the patients were losing so much weight. And TB, the bacteria, loves oxygen. It is what we call an obligate aerobe, and that becomes an important issue where it lives in the lung. TB is, is well, not exclusively, but commonly an upper lobe disease of the lung. So these are pictures of CAT scans. This is the upper part. Here are some x-rays, top of the right lung, type of the right lung as well. And the reason this becomes an issue is because going back to the first, the picture I showed with physiology, we have more oxygen in the tops of our lung. And because TB loves to live in oxygen, we'll find it up in this part of the lung. TB treatment now is pretty easy to treat generally, and it's treated with four antibiotics, uh, INH, rifampin, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide. And these are often given by the Department of Health. Uh, TB had gone significantly down in the United States in the late 1970s, even into the 19, early 1980s. And TB came roaring back, really because of the HIV epidemic in the 80s and 90s. And now most TB in the United States actually is not associated with HIV, but is associated, associated uh, with immigration. Uh, and in the city of Stanford, every year, I put this up, I guess, four or five years ago. I looked this up last night. It's about the same number. We have almost 90 cases of TB a year within uh, Stanford, which includes the Stanford catchment area, which is Stanford, New Canaan, and Darien, uh, that are seen by the state. And in fact, one of the lung doctors, every, every other week, twice a month, we go to the state TB clinic to treat the patients with TB. So still, TB still exists. It hasn't gone away. And in fact, most of the rest of the world, it's one of the major, one of the major disease issues. Uh, this summer and fall, people were talking about Ebola constantly. And a lot of people like to point out that more people were dying of TB at any given time uh, by multiple factors over people dying of Ebola throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and uh, Southeast Asia as well. It really continues to be a problem. So COPD uh, is uh, what is sort of often thought of as the old name uh, for emphysema. So just uh, this week, I think it was Wednesday night last week, David Letterman finally retired uh, after his long run as the host of The Tonight Show. But the big controversy earlier in his career was whether he was going to take over for Johnny Carson in the fight with Jay Leno. And really, the only reason Leno and Letterman were fighting about this was because Johnny Carson really had progressed to the point that he had to go off the air. And Carson ultimately died of COPD. Uh, nowadays, to find a picture of any celebrity with a cigarette is very rare. But Carson, if you go back to the earlier episodes, was actually smoking on air frequently. So COPD is now, as I mentioned earlier, the third leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, and it's uh, characterized by progressive dyspnea, cough, and mucus production. And the number one cause for COPD is smoking. And as I like to tell the residents and med students, number two is smoking. Number three is smoking. Number four is smoking. Number five is smoking. I could do this uh, ad nauseum. Uh, while there are some genetic diseases that are associated with COPD, one called alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, alpha-1, as lung doctors, it's asked to us all the time on our boards and tests we take. The majority of us will go through our entire career and never make a diagnosis of alpha-1, yet we'll see 10 patients a day with COPD in the office. So smoking is by far number one. When you look histologically, uh, it's characterized by destruction of the lung. So on a, on a microscope, if we looked earlier, you saw all the tissue on COPD. It's very, very white. 
from there. And this is a picture of lungs with COPD, and they're sort of ratted out and chewed out tissue when you look at it. X-rays for COPD, when they get ratted out, become very big. The lungs are very, very big in COPD. On the top, if these are normal, you can see how very big COPD lungs are. And sometimes they're so big, we don't even see them on an X-ray completely. Now, I said before that as we started, our lung function got worse. So even since I told you your lung function got worse, your lung function got worse again. Uh, but not so much that you noticed it, but this shows what happens to people who smoke or don't. So this is our, the line of people who don't smoke. So here, here, here as the night goes on. People who smoke drop down much more rapidly in their lung function and therefore reach debility from their breathing or death from their lung function at a much earlier age. How do we treat COPD? Well, the number one way to treat COPD is to stop smoking. Uh, for certain patients, we need oxygen if they need it. There are medications increasingly, uh, albuterol, uh, a whole host of other ones if you watch TV, lots of ads. And very rarely do we need to do a surgery where they take out the destroyed or, or damaged part of the lung, and lung transplant uh, can be an option as well. Uh, beyond transplant, they're actually trying other new devices now. This is something called a numerix or a, a coil, uh, which is the major trial is basically done and will probably be a commercially available option for patients with COPD in the next couple of years. So just like stents are able to keep parts of the coronary arteries open and help patients with heart disease, for the lungs, these are actually, they don't keep the lungs open, they're helping actually collapse down, which is what we're trying to do in COPD, and I think these will become uh, part of our treatment in the future. Now, COPD's other sort of related obstructive lung disease is asthma, and this is Merritt Bjorgen, and I'm assuming nobody in here is a major cross-country skiing fan, uh, but if you were, she would be a name that you would recognize. She's one of the dominant Olympic athletes uh, from Norway who won a number of gold medals. Now, there became a lot of controversy with her because she was using asthma medicines during the Olympics, and a question as to why so many athletes in the Olympics have asthma. So asthma is a chronic inflammatory disease in the lung. About 300 million people in the United States, sorry, 300 million people worldwide with asthma, uh, and it's often runs in families and related to allergies. So if a normal bronchus is a big open tube like this, in asthma it gets kind of clumped down, constricted, and filled with mucus. So as I mentioned before, people always ask, why do so many Olympian, Olympic athletes have asthma? Uh, and really part of the issue is when we exercise, our lung function gets worse. So when we start our lung functions here, we start to exercise, it drops, and then it goes back up. And the symptoms we'll feel of shortness of breath, wheezing, chest tightness, and cough often mimic those of asthma. So it's hard to distinguish between the two. Uh, so the asthma diagnosis uh, often has to do with uh, the type of Olympics, but you can see here that uh, within the Olympics, this goes back to Sydney, Salt Lake, Athens, and, and Torino, uh, about somewhere between 5 and 7% of athletes had asthma, but between 7 and 15% of uh, medalists actually had asthma. It's a very controversial topic amongst the Olympic uh, organization. It also has to do with what sport the athletes play. Long-distance sports uh, are much more common to have asthmatics. And probably this doesn't have to do with the sport, it doesn't have to do with the people, but actually has to do with what you would pick for the sport you would go into. So if sports that have very short bursts of energy are not good for asthmatics because their lung function is going to drop and then come back up. Uh, if you would have a longer endurance sport, you'd be better at that because you'd get through the initial hump. It's also genetics as well. Uh, asthma is more common amongst Northern Europeans, North Americans. Uh, certainly in terms of athletes, so you'll see sports like table tennis, there's a much uh, higher percentage of athletes from East Asia, and the rate of asthma is much lower. All right, so uh, tobacco is really the big issue for lung doctors, as I mentioned, in a lot of ways, because COPD, lung cancer, and other diseases come from smoking cessation. Uh, and we think that tobacco abuse is the number one preventable health problem in the United States. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, if you don't smoke, you often don't know how much a pack of cigarettes are. And if you ask most people how much a pack of cigarettes cost, they'll tell you what it either cost when they quit smoking or what it was when they were a senior in high school, uh, and they're way off. So a, cig a pack of cigarettes now, as a lung doctor, I always look 
at the store is somewhere between eight and ten dollars per pack. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, I like to tell patients that you can lease a Honda Accord. In fact, now you, get, you probably get something a lot nicer than a Honda Accord uh, if you quit smoking and paid for it from there. Um, this is from uh, 2011, and uh, Obama actually was, uh, President Obama was smoking all the way through the first election uh, to presidency, and really only in 2011 was he announced that he had actually finally quit smoking. Uh, now, I always like to think that when you think back about quitting smoking, you have to go back a generation. And these are some of my favorite ads, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarettes. I asked at Stanford Hospital today, nobody's smoking camels right now. Uh, or 2,679 physicians say luckies are less irritating. I guess the 2080th <laughs> thought they were more irritating. But at any rate, if you go back a generation, you can understand why people were smoking cigarettes. Uh, now, getting people to quit smoking is actually very, very difficult. Now, there's lots of drugs on the market uh, to help people. Nicotine replacement, Shantix is a popular one. Uh, but one of my favorite trials, this was published a few years ago, actually paid people to quit smoking. So this was done by General Electric. It was to their advantage to get people to quit smoking. And they basically said, if you quit smoking, we're going to pay you upwards between three and $5,000 to quit smoking. And lo and behold, at the end of a year, the same number of people <laughs> were, were still smoking, whether they got paid as well. So quitting smoking is very difficult. And the best way to quit smoking is clearly to never start smoking. Now, fortunately, in the United States, the rate of smoking has dropped pretty significantly from the 1960s to now. And in Connecticut, uh, the total percentage of the adult population is about 19% who quit smoking. The problem is, over the last 10 years, we've done very little to drop it from that 18 to 19% where it's been. And really, the reason is most smokers are almost, for lack of a better term, closeted now. They can't smoke in restaurants. They can't smoke in most public places. So uh, to get to convince them to quit smoking more is difficult. Uh, in the last couple of years, e-cigarettes have become a very important thing. So people have seen these. Uh, and this is where tobacco is vaporized. Now, they are marketed to actually look just like cigarettes but they really have um, no odor uh, as well. And for lung doctors, there's some thought that could these be better for patients to try to help them quit smoking. Uh, the issue is that it's kind of controversial. There's clearly it's not a good idea to smoke anything. Uh, there's very little evidence that these actually help people quit smoking. Uh, while lung doctors like to point out all the negative pulmonary effects of smoking, there's cardiovascular effects of nicotine as well. And uh, they're the same for, for, for e-cigarettes or vaping cigarettes. And in the United States, the rate amongst kids has gone way up. Uh, so uh, in high school seniors, uh, it's about 20% now have used electronic cigarettes uh, within the last month. The issue is that when you start electronic cigarettes, you're more likely to then use combustible cigarettes uh, as well. I like to point out that the ads for e-cigarettes look exactly like the ads from tobacco from the 1940s and 50s. You know, they all look sort of sexy and glamorous smoking e-cigarettes, and they'll say they rise from the ashes and they're not as bad, but it's something that's clearly very important. So I wanted to end with a little bit of time, so just by way of little review, but pulmonary diseases are the leading cause when you add them up of death and morbidity in the United States. If you can think a little bit about histology, anatomy, physiology, of the diseases, it helps to understand how we think of these diseases. Um, there's a lot of different tests we order for the lung. And again, we think of the anatomy, the physiology, and the histology in terms of what test to do. If you remember any one fact, we like to point out that lung cancer is the number one cancer killer in the United States more than the other cancers combined. So these are my doctors, my house. Those are my two daughters uh, from a year ago. One's turning three and five this week. So I'll leave that. I think we have enough time for a couple questions. Radon. What, okay, so radon is, so I have to say, I've talked to people before and I had to knit like four years ago, I couldn't answer this question because I didn't know the answer. Radon is, is a gas, it's, there's no smell, and it's very common in southern New England in our houses. So anybody who's ever tried to sell a house has had to go through the process of either abating their house for radon, getting it tested for radon. There is a strong association between radon and lung cancer. The problem is the evidence and sort of mathematics to test for it is difficult. Uh, 
I jumped up and down and said, smoking, smoking, smoking is the leading cause of cancer death in the United States. Or, sorry, leading cause of lung cancer. In fact, if you add up non-smokers with lung cancer is the sixth leading cause of all cancer death in the United States, uh, which really is a, not a reflection of how many patients, but how uh, devastating lung cancer can be. There's probably radon affecting that as well. We don't do routinely at all when patients are diagnosed with lung cancer as either never smokers or less smokers to test radon in their house. But I think it is probably worthwhile for people to do. Um, most of us will get a radon system if we're trying to sell our house or we're trying to move, but I think it is worth servicing and looking at it as well. Can you repeat that again? What did you say about non-smoking? Non-smoke, so the sixth leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. is never smokers with lung cancer. So say that another way. What percent of lung cancer patients never smoke? So the percent, so... Uh, somewhere between uh, 5 and 10% never smoke, but it's increasing. And do they have any theory about the cause? So it's hard to know. So there are other causes. So radon is one of them. One is uh, one of the proportions for lung cancer is just age. So as a population, people, heart disease goes down, other cancers go down, you'll see more lung cancer. But lung cancers amongst never smokers actually have different genetics. Um, and there's a lot of work on chemotherapy to find different genetics. So they actually have better prognosis than a smoker with lung cancer, uh, but nobody's really sure the exact reason why, whether they're family genetics, there are other mutations that occur. Uh, lung uh, air pollution is associated with lung cancer as well. Uh, has, there, has there been any tests done with ozone to compare ozone with lung cancer? I don't know ozone in particular. I know the cities that have, people have looked at cities, air, air quality in those cities and sort of subtracted out background smoking as a confounding variable. Cities that have the worst air quality have higher rates of cancer overall. So whether it's increased level of um, hydrocarbons or decreased levels of ozone, they probably all play a factor together in terms of lung cancer. <laughs> but, you know, I've been living in a clean environment for the rest of my life. So do lungs heal? So problem is lungs actually don't heal particularly well. Um, they, uh, when patients have, um, lung, patients who smoke, let me see if I can find the, uh, the slide, um, this, when you quit smoking, you actually, it's not that you go back up to this part of the slide, this part of the curve. You just go back down to that part of the curve. So probably there's this curve, if this is the curve, if you live in northern New Hampshire or Vermont with great air, the, the curve of living in LA or Salt Lake City or Denver, which have horrendous air quality, uh, is, is steeper as well. And when you move out, your, your rate of lung function will go back to the baseline population. But our lungs itself don't actually heal particularly well. So two, two great points and interesting things. So lung cancer death in the United States for men has gone down and actually is, is decreasing completely. Lung cancer death for women has sort of hit the top of the curve. And the reason for that is lung cancer death or lung cancer diagnosis, just you move, you just got to move back roughly 40 years to what was going on in society. So uh, there's, if you think about, there's a famous story, um, William Oshner, who was the surgeon who f was sort of the chief of surgery at Tulane Medical School, has written a story, I mean, this is 100 years ago, but that when he was a student at Washington University in St. Louis, there was a story that there was a patient with a lung cancer in the operating room, and they had to run to go see this surgery. It was so rare that there was a lung cancer case, this is 1912, uh, that everybody had to see it. 
Fast forward 20 years later, lung cancer, even by the mid-1920s, had become one of the leading cancer killers in the United States because the industrialization of cigarettes occurred in the 1890s uh, with the American Tobacco Company and James Duke bringing tobacco. So for women, go from there. Now, in terms of polio, and I don't think polio was transmitted to children. Uh, pol I'll admit that I did pediatric training. I don't do it now, but polio is one of those things that we don't really talk about that much anymore. There's actually therapeutic theories of using polio viruses for, for different things as well. But uh, for us now, polio would be one of those things that if an epidemic came back, none of us would even know what to look for <laughs> for polio because if you're of a generation that you didn't see it, you wouldn't know. So one of the main parts of treatment for lung diseases, so for COPD, for a disease called pulmonary fibrosis as well, is something we call pulmonary rehab. Uh, and pulmonary rehab is a dedicated program uh, to help patients. The issue with pulmonary rehab is it actually doesn't help your lungs that much, surprisingly. When we breathe and sort of sense how short of breath we are, it's a function of our lungs themselves, our cardiac function, and our musculoskeletal function. And to get, if you have impaired lung function, the way you'll sort of feel better and do better is by improving the other aspects of your breathing. So, so those would be increasing your cardiovascular stamina and increasing your, uh, your musculoskeletal uh, strength. There are some lung breathing exercises that patients who have advanced lung diseases do, something called purslip breathing, where they will learn to breathe or slow their breathing down as well. But in terms of can you sort of work yourself up to get your lungs better, unfortunately, no, there really isn't much. Breathing during sleep when you're at the most relaxed time, uh, and sometimes some people even feel wake a little short of breath. Does the position have anything to do in breathing in the lungs? Should you be laying in a, like with acid reflux, they tell you to lay asleep, head of the bed? Would that? So for, I could have, obviously, for, I could have gone on for like eight hours on lung diseases, both for interest and topics. And uh, sleep apnea is thought of as a lung disease and something lung doctors like myself treat all the time. And sleep apnea is one of the most common chronic medical conditions in the United States. And it has to do with breathing at night. So when we breathe at night, we relax and our breathing slows down and the back of our throats actually relax as well. And that's why you'll hear people snore, the <laughs> that's air going back. If we relax so much, it will close down, and that's sleep apnea, which is very common. Now, your position can affect sleep apnea greatly. Sleep apnea is at its maximum on your back because anatomically, that's where your throat and all the extra muscle and tissue will lay back and go down. Sleep apnea is the least when you're on your stomach because it's the easiest way to breathe. Side as well. So when we actually do a sleep study, um, whether we do it at home, which is the way we increasingly do them, or in the hospital, one of the issues we look at is what side you're on and if you're stopping breathing. Some people have sleep apnea, whether it's mild sleep apnea, and we can, all we do is prop them up on a bunch of pillows and they can get through the night and be fine. Or some people have very positional sleep apnea as well. And so if you're on your stomach, it's going to be the least. If you're on your back, the most. If you're sitting up, it's going to be less as well because you won't have that problem. So you'll find people, if they're sleeping on the couch, they're not snoring that much. But when they fall off to the side, you hear grandpa going <laughs> the whole night, the whole night long. You said side. Does it matter which side? After right side? No, not really. Didn't they smoke in the Middle East, those hookahs and things? Are those similar to e-cigarettes? And do they get lung cancer at the same kind of frequency? So, um, no, that's still combustible tobacco. So hookahs can be either condensed tobacco, uh, basically put into a resin and then fired, or the tobacco leaves themselves. Now, they're run through a water pipe, which does clean things out a little bit, but they will go from there. Now, figuring out uh, rates of lung cancer for different, uh, for different 
types of tobacco is a little bit more tricky in terms of pipe smoking, cigar smoking. Uh, there's increasingly people ask questions about marijuana smoking and the risk of lung cancer, but you'll go from there. So uh, any type of combustible tobacco is going to increase your risk. The issue is that people don't smoke as much of cigars or pipes as they would just conventional cigarettes. Well, part of it is we don't know exactly yet. Um, and it's a controversial topic. Um, one, um, people tend not to smoke as much cannabis as they tend to smoke tobacco. So uh, for a lot of different reasons, you're not smoking 20 uh, joints a day walking around. But I don't think people know the real answers yet. Uh, personally, as a lung doctor, I still have a hard argument for combustible drugs for anything. So uh, um, whether we were to tell people to smoke their high blood pressure medicine or smoke their, uh, you know, their cholesterol medicine would seem a little bit bad. So we've known through the years that many inhaled medications end up with problems long term. Inhaled insulin was sort of all the rage about 15 years ago until we realized it was horrendous for people's lungs and we gave up on it. So I think the story on, on cannabis isn't completely written yet. You don't have any evidence of any uh, disease. Do you increase the longevity of your life? Yeah. So if you quit smoking uh, at 80, you smoke for 60 years and you quit smoking, you will live longer than an 80-year-old who's still smoking. It does not matter what age you quit smoking. There are some health benefits. Some of the issues will probably never change. So, for example, your lung cancer risk is probably not going to change appreciably, but your cardiovascular risk goes down pretty rapidly after you quit smoking as well. Infection risks go down tremendously. Smokers have higher rates of pneumonia. Uh, and some of that is because of their chronic lung disease, and some of that's related to acute lung disease as well. So if you quit smoking at any age, it's going to have a health benefit. And would that same thing apply to living in an, an unhealthful era? If you remove yourself from an unhealthful area, you have less chance of having a lung disease? Probably. Actually, there's evidence that there's increased cardiovascular risk for patients who live in bad um, or poor air quality environments as well. So living in better air quality is always going to be good. Now, the problem is you're trading things off. So, you know, where you live, there's different, there's different markers for everything. Some places have better air quality, but they have other, other issues associated with it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> So they get pneumonia and bronchitis probably for a couple different reasons. One is their lungs themselves are destroyed. So there's tissue that actually itself are more susceptible uh, for lung infection. So we all have bacteria in our lungs at any given moment. But it's the, the response from our body to those bacteria, and as that changes, you're more likely to get an infection. So uh, they them, the, that destroyed tissue will do that. Second... Uh, if you're actively smoking, your own immune system, which is going to fight off infections, is reduced in that circumstance. So smoker, people who are actively smoking with emphysema or COPD are more likely to develop those, those infections as well. You spend a great deal of time talking about diagnosis. Of what about treatment? If someone does have lung cancer, it just sounds like the uh, more possibility of living. Well, no. I mean, so it, lung cancer really depends upon when, what stage you're diagnosed at and going from there. So uh, for patients who have early stage lung cancer, uh, the treatment is surgery. Uh, and the outcome for patients who have surgery for lung cancer is really pretty good. Uh, you're talking about 80% uh, five-year survival if you have a limited stage lung cancer going from there. Uh, part of the issue for us is that most of the patients are not diagnosed in early stages, and that's why screening programs or increased awareness can help push to get that number of patients to be a higher percentage. All advanced stage lung cancer started as a limited stage. So you get it at the, according to you, if you don't have the screening, so let's say most are chronic stage three, what happens? 
So if you're stage three or four, the, the survivals have, have really only slightly improved over the last 20 years. In the last five years, there's really been a big push for new chemotherapies. So uh, up through sort of, I, I think the articles were about 1982, 83, through 2010, the chemotherapy for lung cancer was not very different. It was very, very similar. And for small cell lung cancer, it still has not changed. Now with each lung cancer, we actually look for specific genetic mutations in lung cancer. There are things we call EGFR markers, ROS markers, KRAS, ALK. And if you have these mutations, they're actually generally pills for the lung cancer. And these have dramatically changed the survival for patients with those, those mutations themselves. A mammogram doesn't really look very well at the lungs at all. Not clear. Not clear. And you don't, you, you're just basically looking at the breast tissue. We will sometimes now see women will get breast MRIs if they have suspicious masses on a breast uh, mammography. And you will slightly get a piece of the lung, but you get a very fuzzy, uh -huh. bad piece of the lung. So you don't really see much on mammography at all. I think we've hit 8 o'clock, so uh, thank, you. thank you guys. Thank you.